Hello everybody, this is Tim here back again. Do my Scream 3 review just to start off. Once again, you got Wes Craven back directing the movie. Except this time you got somebody named Aaron Kruger or something like that. I think that's how you pronounce their first name. Writing the script instead of Kevin Williamson. Which might account for some of this film's shortcomings. I'm, But for the story idea they had for this movie was going to Hollywood and everything. I think no matter who wrote this, you probably wouldn't be able to come out with anything. Except something that is, is cheesier than the first two movies. Although I think Kevin Williamson would have done a better job. Well, as far as this film goes, you got Nev Campbell, Courtney Cox, and David Arkent back. The film opens with Lee Schreiber, uh, his Cotton Weary character. He's now like famous and he's got a TV show called 100% Cotton. <laughs> he gets a phone call from the ghost face killer who's using a voice changing device in this movie. Um, which I don't really think they take full advantage of this device. I mean, every time like a character gets called in the movie... I mean, you can tell every time in the movie when it's not the actual character calling another character. Instead, you know that it's the ghost face killer. You can just tell because the scenes aren't timed really well and it doesn't seem like they try to hide it enough. I think they could have had more fun with this device, but instead it just comes off a little bit sloppy in the movie. Um, but you got Cotton Weary. The killer wants to know where Sidney Prescott is. He thinks Cotton will be able to help him find out. Um, because he's got sources <laughs> or connections. Uh, but uh, he tells Cotton he's at his house. He's going to kill his girlfriend if he doesn't tell him where Sidney Prescott lives. Leaf Shopper heads back to his house. Uh, he gets in a struggle with the killer. The killer manages to kill Cotton Weary's girlfriend. And I'll never forgive the movie for this. Cotton Weary, Leaf Shriver is not a little guy. He's a pretty decent sized guy. And he gets a bookshelf down on top of the killer. And all he's got to do is like jump on top of the bookshelf and squish the fucker's guts out and kill him. But the killer just like raises the bookshelf up barely and hits Cotton in the face and he flies backwards. And I'm like, what? And then of course the killer gets out from under the bookshelf and stabs Leaf Shriver to death and kills him. Pretty lame opening kill compared to the second movie. And especially the first one. Pretty weak opening kill here, so right off the bat, that gives you a sign that this movie's probably not going to be as good. You got Patrick Dempsey in this movie, who's a cop who's investigating the killings in the movie. He's alright, but he doesn't really add anything to the movie. His character could have easily have died and wouldn't have made any difference. But, um, the killer in this movie is, like, killing the people, the actors, who are, like, working on the, the stab movie or whatever. Which, why... I'm wondering why doesn't he just go after Sydney's friends and just try to find where Sydney is? Why is he wasting time killing the people who worked on the movie? But whatever. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, most fans that have seen this movie have this pretty much the same gripes out of it as I will, so I won't make this review too long. It's really not really any reason to go into. A, I mean, I don't want to drag this review out and go into a lot of the same problems with the movie that everybody else has pretty much named off. Because these movies have been out for a decent while now, and everybody's pretty much seen them. And everybody pretty much has the same problems with them as I do. So I'll try to keep this review as brief as I can. But uh, Sydney Nev Campbell's pretty much been living on her own. She's been having nightmares about her mom. Wes Craven, going back to like his Nightmare on Elm Street roots here. She's been having nightmares about her mom, because her mom, of course, as we know, is was a Titanic whore. So um, she's been having nightmares about her mom, because she's afraid she's going to turn out just like her. The... The killer's killing off the cast members of the new Stab movie, Stab 3. You get, like, Jenny McCarthy in the movie, and he kills her in the in the studio. And she's running around. And one thing I found funny, she's trying to hit the killer with these weapons, but they're all prop weapons, so they don't do any damage. He pretty much just throws her through a door and stabs her in the back. Another thing about this movie is there's too many coincidences in this movie. Like, the, uh, like Jenny McCarthy's character... Uh, gets ready. To, uh, she's running away because she knows the killer's in in the studio, and she can run outside. But the security guard is standing there, but the door's wide open. Instead, she runs into the room where the killer just happens to be. And I'm like, how the fuck did the killer know that she would run directly into that room where he just happened to be? What if she would just ran outside? If the security guard wouldn't have been standing there, then she could have just left. I'm like, that's a pretty fucking big coincidence. And most of the killings in this movie are really tame. I heard it was because of the Columbine incident and the MPAA was like butt-fucking horror movies at this point. Because of Columbine, they wanted everybody to trim the violence down in their movies and shit. Which, that sucks. This movie has the weakest killings out of all the movies, including Part 4. Um, because they're just stabs in the back. Almost every single fucking killing is a stab in the back. 
over and over. Stab, 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 right in the back. I mean, it, that's it. That's almost all the kills. But uh, Jenny McCarthy gets killed by getting stabbed in the back. So I'm like, that's kind of lame. Um, as for the other characters, like the actors, they're okay. They're pretty much just cannon fodder. They don't really add anything to the movie. Um, and then Courtney Cox gets, she's a reporter, so she comes there to, like, investigate, you know, the killings and shit and whatever. And just so happens David R. Kent is, is working there at the movie studio as, like, a consultant on the film. I'm like, okay, that's kind of a big coincidence that they're both there. The killer finds out where Nev Campbell lives, uh, Sydney's character, I mean, Nev Campbell's character, Sydney, finds out where she lives. And so, of course, Sydney has to come out of hiding. And for most of this movie, Sydney is just, like, kind of sitting on her ass at her house. She doesn't really even do anything, Nev Campbell don't. And I know it's because Nev Campbell was shooting another movie at the time, and she couldn't uh, do too much in Scream 3 because of that. But I'm like, at the same time, she's the main character. Where the fuck is she? But anyway, and once again, it's back with Dewey and Gale. They're not together again, just like the second movie, and they're arguing again, but they still really love each other again. So it's like same shit, different day. Um, the two cops that are investigating the case, like you got Patrick Dempsey and uh, this other cop, who I don't know the guy's name, but uh, he has some funny lines in the movie. Like, he's talking to, like, the people that are working on the movie, and they're like, Detective, is there any reason to think that Cotton Weary's death might have anything to do with this film? And, see, Cotton Weary is supposed to have a cameo in the movie, and the detective, like, replies to him. He's like, he was working on a movie called Stab. He was stabbed. <laughs> I thought that was funny. That joke was pretty funny. Another thing, the humor in this movie, there's too much fucking humor. Like, and it's just, there's some even, like, really over-the-top jokes in this movie. Like, you, like, Courtney Cox, like, walks outside, and there standing is, like, fucking Jay and Silent Bob, and they call her Connie Chung. And I'm like, and she gives them the finger, and I'm like, oh, God. It's like Jay and Silent Bob as the characters Jay and Silent Bob. That's way too much. That's, that's, you're pushing it right there. That's just too fucking silly for me. Um, eventually, Nev Campbell comes back into the movie. Oh, before I forget, before that, you got, like, this big scene. But this bodyguard gets knocked in the back. This is one one time when I like the voice changer bit. This uh, this bodyguard named Stone or whatever, I think is the guy's name. He's like in David Arkent's trailer and he thinks he's talking to David Arkent on the phone. And uh, he goes, what are you doing in my trailer? And uh, the guy's like, the bodyguard's like, making sure there's no killer in here waiting to knife you like he did your little, uh, like what happened to your little sister. And then, uh, and then uh, the killer's talking to him in David Arkent's voice and he's like, well, why would you say something like that? That makes me very angry. And he fucking jumps out and he stabs him in the back. Again, the killer stabs the bodyguard in the back. And I'm like, how many fucking stabbings are we going to have in this movie? So the bodyguard gets stabbed in the back. And then the killer beats him in the face with a frying pan. And kills him with a frying pan. And I'm like, this is like Warner Brothers cartoon level shit. And so the killer's on the loose. And Dale, I mean, um, I mean... Gale, and I almost called her Dale for some reason. This cause I'm forgetting a lot of this movie, even the main characters' names, because this is such a weak movie compared to the other two. But anyway, so Gale and Dewey and the rest of the characters or actors or whatever, they're all hiding out in the house. One thing I do like about the movie, I like Parker Posey. She's supposed to be play, playing Gale's character in the movie Stab Three, which she's kind of she's kind of cute in the movie, and she's funny. She's got some humorous lines, but a lot of her comedy is just too silly, though, just too silly. Um, and then so the killer rigs the house to blow up. Everybody else like runs out, and there's one dumbass that stays in there, and he lights a lighter and it ignites some gas and causes the whole place to blow up. Kills that dumbass in a big explosion. Pretty decent explosion, nothing to write home about. One less dumbass in the movie, so that's kind of funny. The rest of them jump over, like, the balcony of the house or whatever, or the edge of the house, and roll down the mountain. Um, Dewey sees the killer. He shoots him down, but then Dewey falls off the side of the, the, the hill like a dumbass and rolls down the rest of the way. Once again, Dewey fucking up. Dewey's goofball routine has kind of gotten on my nerves a little bit by this movie. Just a little, but I still like David R. Kent. Of course, the killer gets away. He rolls under a vehicle and disappears. He's got super speed. And every time at every crime scene, the killer's like leaving a picture of Maureen Prescott, Nev Campbell's character's mom. Um, you don't know why yet, of course, but I'll get to that at the end. And then finally, at the end of the movie, there's like this big party. 
You got this guy named Roman Bridger or whatever. Uh, you think he's dead, but spoiler alert, he actually turns out to be the killer, which is kind of lame because this guy's like nothing to write home about and he's not very imitating. Uh, Nev Campbell, once again, doesn't do pretty much anything in the movie. She's missing from like this entire big act of the movie with all the killings at the at this house party or whatever because it's Roman's birthday and he's having a party at his house. Oh, and you find out that Sydney's mom used to be like a, a horror movie actor in Hollywood. She was ganged raped basically by a bunch of directors. <laughs> and she had an illegitimate kid, I guess, out of that gang rape. And that boy is Roman Bridger, so the killer is Sydney's long lost brother. I'm like, oh, you're entering fucking soap opera territory here. By that point, you just, you lost me. You're entering soap opera reveal right there, boys. There's no. This is definitely the right movie to end the franchise on, although I'm glad they made part four. But I'll get into part four when I get there. But uh, you're entering soap opera territory there. So, yeah, spoiler alert, Roman's the killer. He fakes his own death, which is weird because Courtney Cox checks his pulse, and he's dead. So I'm like, how the fuck did he fake his not having a pulse? How do you do that? that that's not explained. I don't get that. Uh, so Ghostface shows up. He starts killing everybody at the party. Got this one guy named Tyson who I actually found funny because he gets stabbed. He's one of the actors in the movie, or was going to be in Stab 3. Um, he starts running away, and the ghost face is chasing after him. He turns around and sees ghost face, and he goes, Oh, you motherfucker! <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. And I actually kind of like this. The, the ghost face grabs the rug uh, underneath him and fucking like pulls the rug, and the dude like does a flip and like lands on his hand on the floor, and then ghost face grabs him and slings him off the balcony down like the concrete floor around the pool. Uh, I kind of like that, but once again, you don't see him hit the floor. It's just like the kill's cut. Once again, these kills are so tame compared to the ones in 1 and 2. They're so much weaker. Um, and you got this character named like Angelina or something like that, who I believe in the original script was going to turn out to be Roman's girlfriend and be the second killer. That would have made more sense because they don't really do anything with her. She pretty much like starts running to the house because she hears the killers there and he just stabs her. In a really tame scene where you don't hardly you don't really see anything, so she just dies from a stabbing. But once again, another stabbing where you don't hardly see anything. Um. Then, oh, uh, there there are some funny lines as far as the humor goes, though. One of the things I like is that uh, Courtney Cox is like has managed to knock out the killer because they. He grabbed her, and they fell down some stairs, and Ghostface has been knocked out. And she's, like, talking to Dewey on the phone, and David Arkin's like, uh, how do I know you're not the killer? And she's like, open the fucking door. And he goes, well, don't you think that's something the killer would say? <laughs> I love that. Another thing, you get a cameo cameo by Jamie Kennedy in this movie. It uh, A lot of fans have said this cameo was kind of pushing it, because a lot of fans were upset about his character's death in the second movie, so they bring him back with a videotape. That he supposedly left in case a kill another killer came back for a third time, and if it if it turned out the third movie was like a trilogy or whatever, uh, or a conclusion of a trilogy instead of another sequel, these are the trilogy rules. It leaves them some rules for a trilogy or whatever in the video. That is kind of pushing it. You don't really need Jamie Kennedy back, uh, but it was nice to have him there. His character was the fan favorite, including my favorite, so it was nice to have him back. But at the same time, you don't really need it. Uh, but, yeah, and then David Arkent opens the door, he sees, uh, sees Courtney Cox laying down there at the end of the stairs, and he's out of bullets, he can't shoot the killer, who's now woken up, and so, I, this right here, I, I can't forgive the movie for this either, the killer takes the knife he's got in his hand, slings it, and has the, the handle end of the knife hit Dewey in the head, knock him slick out, and Dewey rolls down the stairs, and I'm like, you know what a fucking good shot you'd have to be to be able to throw a knife all the way at the top of the stairs and hit somebody in the head with it directly like that and knock them slick out. You'd have to be fucking amazing. And I don't buy Roman Bridger being able to do that like some horror movie director. Uh, that doesn't that just doesn't compute. But anyway, so he's got them hostage. He gets Sydney to come there uh, to the mansion or whatever. And I'm like, why does he even keep Gale and Dewey alive, why don't he just kill them and just use their voices on the voice box thing he's got? Just pretend he had them. And I'm like, wow, that don't make no fucking sense. Um, another thing I did kind of like in the movie, though, was I did like that uh, 
that they had like on the movie set. It was a perfect recreation of Sydney's house from the first movie for Stab Three. Um, and like Sydney walks on the set, and this is like one of the only times her character gets to do something. This happens a little bit earlier in the movie. Um, um, well, not well. I mean, it happens actually later in the movie. I mean, because it takes a long time for Sydney's character to even get into the action. So by then, you're like, fucking do something, Sydney. <laughs> But anyway, this is one of the scenes I do like in the movie is that she actually goes on the set of her old house and, um, or I mean, she goes on the set with a replica of her old house from the first movie and the killer's like fucking with her using her mom's voice on the voice box. And then, but I'm thinking, how'd the killer get Sydney's mom's voice on his voice changer thing? She's been dead for years. How'd he get her voice? Uh, but anyway. And he keeps fucking with her, and one thing leads to another, and it's a decent little chase scene. They, like, keep, he, like, keeps popping up through different, like, st stage doors or whatever on the set, which is kind of neat. But she manages to get away. Of course, the killer disappears, and Patrick Dempsey and his partner show up, and they can't find the killer. That was a decent scene. Uh, I do like it that the movie tries to kind of make you think Sydney might be hallucinating some of the stuff, but you as the audience know she's not hallucinating stuff, and there's no way she's had a breakdown now. After all the stuff she's been through in 1 and 2, I don't see how this could make her go, <laughs> this part could make her go over the edge. I mean, I don't see how this one could make her go over the edge any more than 1 or 2 could. But, um, eventually Sydney has to come to the mansion at the end. Let me get back to where I was. That's one of the only scenes I like in the movie was that chase or whatever. Um, but eventually Sydney has to come to the mansion at the end because Ghostface calls her and tells her he's gonna, he tells her he's gonna kill Gail and Dewey if she doesn't show up. She shows up there. Um, then you find out, ta-da-da, the killer is Sydney's long-lost brother. <laughs> I'm like, come fucking on, man. <laughs> the killer, I mean, Roman, Roman Bridger's the killer. He, like, takes a chair and knocks the fuck out of Patrick Dempsey and knocks him out. Shoots Sydney down. And the movie tries to give you this big epic moment, making you think that Sydney's dead. And I'm like, who's stupid enough to fall for that? Why the fuck would you fall for that? Because you know, by now, this being the third movie and supposedly the last one, they're not going to kill Sydney. I mean, give me a break here. So, of course, she's alive. She manages to stab Roman, take him down. He's he's getting ready to die, but Nev Campbell, like Sydney, I mean, the character Sydney holds his hand because. Of course, he's her long-lost half-brother, so from a gang rape, I guess. Uh, uh, so she she holds his hand as he's dying. You think he's dead, and then Dewey's like, "Be careful, Sydney." Randy said the killer is superhuman by the time you get up to part three, and uh, Sydney goes, "Nah, don't worry, Dewey. He wasn't superhuman." And then ta ta ta, he jumps up behind him, and Dewey starts shooting the fuck out of him, and he just won't die. And then Sydney says, shoot him in the head, Dewey. And then he shoots him in the head. And Dewey finally fucking kills this guy. So Roman Bridger's dead from a shot to the head. Pretty okay little scene, but kind of silly. Um, uh, and then you get a moment I actually liked. Dewey, uh, everything's okay. Dewey proposes to Gale. So you get the idea that they're probably going to get married, which is kind of sweet. It's about fucking time something happened with that relationship. And then they're all in Sydney's house, and Patrick Dempsey's character's there, and they're all going to watch a movie. And then Sydney gets ready to head in there to watch the movie with them, and then all at once the fucking door, like, comes open. And then she looks at the door and just ignores it and walks away. I guess it's supposed to tell you that she's finally at peace with her life or whatever, and I'm like, why? Why is she finally at peace with her life? She's had three movies of non-stop psychopaths coming after her and trying to murder her. Why is she finally at peace with her life now? I, I don't get that. Why is she finally at peace with her life now? It's just It just seems like it's just it's just there because this is the final movie. That's it. Something like that has to be earned with the character. Nothing in this movie has made me feel like she's come to terms with her existence in life of being someone who's constantly targeted by nutcases. And another thing, this movie just feels a little bit too safe. Like, the three main characters, Gail and Sydney and Dewey, you don't really feel like they're in really any danger. That's another problem. After part two ended, all the characters are pretty much dead except for those three. And then in this one, all the characters are pretty much dead except for those three. Unless you count Patrick Dempsey, but he really didn't do anything. 
So, <laughs> it's kind of like, just feels like same shit, different day here with number three. I would kind of wish Pat, uh, Parker Posey would have survived at least. Because she was at least likable because she keeps talking about how her Gale Weathers is the better Gale Weathers or better or, or better than the real Gale Weathers talking to Courtney Cox all the time about that. Kind of wish she would have survived. That would, that would have been alright. But she, of course, she died in the movie as well from a fucking stab in the back. Another death from a stab, a backstab. <laughs> or at least... Well, it wasn't a backstab. It was actually just a regular stab. But she didn't even fucking see anything when she died. She also got killed in the mansion at the end during the party. So her character was pretty much just wasted. Um, and so that's pretty much the end of the the review here. Because that's the... I pretty much wrapped up everything for this movie. It's been a bit jumbled and jumped around. Because this movie kind of left me with a little bit of a lackluster feel. Once again, it's not a horrible movie. Some fans try to act like it's like the worst movie ever or whatever. But it's not that bad. It's a two and a half star film out of four for me personally. It's an alright movie. I mean, it's nothing to write home about. It's not anything to run out and see. But if you're a fan of these movies and you've seen the first two... Fuck it, why not watch number three? But I can definitely see why fans would consider this the weakest of the three movies. Or of the four movies. I keep forgetting there's another one. Because this movie tries to wrap everything up. But yeah, all in all, this is a two and a half star movie. It's an alright movie. Not anything to run out and see. Definitely the weakest of the four movies. But a decent, a decent time killer. Or alright time killer, I mean. So I'll see you guys again with Scream 4. The final screen. <laughs>